We believe that one of the effects of baptism is the indwelling of the Spirit of God, and that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ sacramentally present. Yet some are baptized, and they seem no different than the unbaptized. And so many go to communion regularly, yet do not have apparent signs of holiness. In this episode, we will dig deep into the Church's sacramental theology and look at how to receive what God is offering us in the sacraments. Welcome to Physically Spiritual. I have been amazed by how much growing physically healthier has changed my spiritual life. I am captivated with discovering the truth about my body and how it relates to my relationship with God. Physically Spiritual is my attempt to harmonize and share what I have discovered. I'm your host, Andrew Reinhardt. As we get started, I want to remind you about my website, becominggift.com, where you can find all the show notes and episodes of Physically Spiritual, all of my uh, writing, and also, if you want help applying any of the ideas we talk about on the show, I'm here to help as a coach. So go to becominggift.com. Physically Spiritual is a show on Awaken Catholic, and Awaken has a new app. Uh, Go to theawakenapp.io or search the Awaken app on uh, Google Play or the App Store on your Apple device and get the new Awaken app. The new and improved Awaken app is the best way to watch all the shows we publish here on Awaken Catholic, Uh, get notifications whenever your favorite shows are published, and also you can interact with other fans and the show hosts on a new interactive section of the app. So get the new Awaken app. And if you want to support everything we do here at Awaken Catholic, consider becoming a part of the Awaken Nation. The Awaken Nation is our our patron community or community of supporters who are willing for a a small amount of money every month uh, to support everything we do to pay for all the costs of making this happen. But in, in exchange, you receive exclusive content and access to premium parts of the app. So go to awakencatholic.org forward slash donate to become a part of the nation. We are also partners with the Hollow app. The Hollow is a Catholic meditation app to help you find peace and grow in your spiritual journey. If you want to check out Hollow, you can get a a free trial membership or sign up with a a special code at hollow.app forward slash awaken. Hollow has a great introduction to prayer, different meditations you can try, or even sleep stories. So go to hollow.app forward slash awaken. So in the second season of Physically Spiritual, we're simply asking the question, how do I become holy? How do I become the person that God is inviting me to be? And we're exploring three legs to the stool. The leg of a sacramental theology is what we're uh, launching here. And then we're also going to talk about prayer and we're going to talk about asceticism in episodes to come. So let's go to that stool. So on the stool, we have three legs, sacraments, prayer, and asceticism. And this three-legged stool, I think, is a great image because when you're on three legs, you're comfortable, you're growing, you're becoming like God, you're becoming the person God calls you to be. If you don't have all three legs under you, you're in a balancing act, meaning you might have the illusion of security, the illusion of growth, but eventually you fall back over. It's by these three practices these three things we integrate into our life that we're on sure ground as we progress toward the Lord, the sacraments, prayer, and asceticism. So first, let's start off by just asking the question, what the heck is a sacrament? Well, the Baltimore Catechism gives this simple, great definition. It's an outward sign instituted by Christ to give us grace. An outward sign, meaning it's something we experience with our senses. We touch it, we hear it, we see it, we smell it, we taste it. Right? These are our external senses that we talk about. We experience an outward sign. It's instituted by Christ, meaning it's either uh, something that Christ started or something that was already here that Christ elevated to the dignity of a sacrament. But it all comes from Christ's ministry, and it gives us grace. Grace is God's favor. It's God's own divine life. It's God giving us the ability to become what he calls us to be, to heal us and become like him, to be divinized. So they they communicate this grace to us. Uh, To really understand the sacraments, we need to understand 
or what's sometimes called instrumentality. Instrumentality, the same word we use for like instrument, uh, meaning you might use a, a medical instrument to perform surgery or a musical instrument to play music, but it's something you use as, as a means to accomplish something you want to do. And the whole story of, of the scripture is a story of instrumentality. Right? When God interacts with his creation, when God interacts with his people, he chooses to do it through the world he created and through different means. We're all invited into this story. So part of being a saint is becoming an instrument of the Lord's work in the world. And the way that God wants us to make us holy is, is through the world, either through the instruments of his creation, through the instruments of his new creation, the church and the sacraments, or through the instruments of others around us, right? That God with flesh on around us, the people whom around us doing God's work. So all the grace of the sacraments comes from God, right? These aren't magic spells. They don't have a power in and of themselves, right? All the grace of the sacraments comes to, come to us from God. And the primary instrument that God uses in the sacraments is Christ's human nature, right? God came to us in the incarnation, and Christ is fully God and fully human, not half and half, not all God and kind of human or all human and kind of God, but fully God and fully human. God comes to us in this way, and, and God continues to work through Christ's incarnation through the sacraments, and especially through the church. Right? St. Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. Right? The, the church is, is God's body working through time and space. In the early church, they actually referred to the church as the prolongment of the incarnation, meaning what Christ was doing in his ministry, the church then kept doing uh, in time after he rose to heaven. This is a great way to, to read the Acts of the Apostles. It's simply uh, sort of Christ's public ministry again, but now the church and the apostles are doing what Christ was doing in the Gospels. And then finally, through the church, Christ institutes seven sacraments, seven signs of grace. And these are, are baptism, Holy Communion or the Eucharist, confirmation, holy orders, right, how we ordain deacons, priests, and bishops, matrimony or marriage, a confession or, or penance, sometimes called, or anointing of the sick, right, the prayers that, that the priest prays over a sick person. These are the seven sacraments. But these are our instruments that God uses to give us his grace. And Christ is the primary instrument. Christ's human nature is the primary instrument by which God brings this grace into the world through the church. Uh, it's important to realize that the whole story of salvation is a story of instrumentality. Right? When, when God comes to his people, he chooses to come to them in a way that's compatible with them. God created humans with senses, with bodies. So when God comes to his people, they experience him in their bodies. Uh, just going through the Old Testament quickly, when Adam and Eve hide from the Lord after they sin, Adam says, I heard you coming, meaning with my ears, God made a sound. He heard him. Later on, Jacob wrestles with God, and he's given the name Israel after this encounter, physically wrestling with God. It's not a metaphor. He physically had this interaction with the Lord. As the Lord was, was leading his chosen people out of Egypt, he led them as a pillar of fire, right? a pillar of fire that took them through the desert at night and then a pillar of cloud during the day. Right? This was, was real. And then finally, later on, the prophet Samuel, when Samuel was receiving his calling when he was in the temple, he heard the Lord in a whisper, right? in, in a soft voice. He had to listen, but it was audible. Throughout the whole Old Testament, God comes to his people in a way that they experience through their senses. So now in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, uh, if God chose to not come to his people in a way that they could experience with their senses, that would be weird. That would be different. So we believe that God came to his people in a way that was uh, simply a continuation, an intensification of what he had already been doing, first in the Incarnation, and God becoming man and interacting with, with people. And then in the church being the sacrament of Christ, right? That visible sign, that outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. And then through the seven sacraments, the particular ways the church continues the incarnation. 
Here's what the, the Second Vatican Council has to say about this in its constitution about the church in the modern world. He says, Christ, the one mediator, established and continually sustains here on earth his holy church, the community of faith, hope, and charity as an entity with visible delineation through which he communicated truth and grace to all. Right, Christ is the one mediator. Right, it's the primary instrument of what God is doing. It all comes from Christ's, uh, Christ's incarnation, His salvific work in ministry, and then His passion, death, and resurrection. All the grace comes through Christ. But Christ instituted a visible church to confer this grace on His people through time and space. It says the society structured with hierarchical organs and the mystical body of Christ are not to be considered as two separate realities, as two realities. Meaning as a church, we have both a hierarchy, right? we, have, we, have, uh, we have buildings, we have a people whom are ordained in the leadership, a pope, bishops, priests, deacons, and lay people who enter lay ecclesial ministry and work within this church. And we also have this idea of the mystical body, that the church is the mystical body of Christ. So there's also something about the church that's hard to touch. Uh, so these aren't two separate things. In a sense, uh, in, in early episodes of Physically Spiritual, we talked about hylomorphism, right? that all things are constituted of form and matter, that each substance is both physical and spiritual. So the church is the same way. The church is hylomorphic. It has matter. It has the visible side, the hierarchy, and it also has uh, form. It has the mystical side as the body of Christ. So they're not to be considered two realities. It says, nor are the visible assembly and the spiritual community, uh, nor the earthly church and the church enriched with heavenly things. Rather, they form one complex reality, which coalesces from a divine and a human element. For this reason, by no weak analogy, it is compared to the mystery of the incarnate word. Right? The church is this prolongment of the incarnation through time and space, as Christ gave uh, gave flesh to God's div divinity to the people of the first century, the church continues to give flesh to Christ's presence in the world uh, for the centuries after that. All right. So this is the foundation of the idea of sacraments, that God created us to experience the world with our senses, that God continued to interact with his people through their senses in history, and that in the New Covenant, the New Testament, God continues to do the same thing. And this continues on in the church and in her seven sacraments. So in the introduction to this episode, I brought up this point, um, and I don't want to be too harsh, but it, it stands to be true that many people are, are a great scandal to the existence of the church and the sacraments in that they claim membership in the church, they get baptized, they receive the sacraments, and yet they don't seem any different than anyone else. Right? It, it leaves the world pondering, do these sacraments have any effect at all? Or is it all just this weird old stuff that we haven't let go of yet? <laughs> right? Do these sacraments really change people's lives? So th there's a special kind of grace in the sacraments, Grace is just God's favor, God's divine life. And it's called sacramental grace. Uh, but then there's also another perspective on grace. We might call it actual grace. Actual grace is grace that, that has an effect in our day-to-day -day life, meaning the grace that might change the outcome of, of a choice that I make. If I'm, Let's say maybe I have a bad habit or an addiction. Well, if I pray to the Lord and I receive a grace to act differently in a particular day, that's an actual grace. And I may also receive habitual graces, meaning I have a stable state of relationship with the Lord by which I'm the person that God calls me to be. So the, the question that answers this, this deep problem that we have, this scandal of sacraments that seem to not affect people, is how do we make sacramental grace into actual grace or habitual grace? How do we span this? I heard this explained uh, when I was in college um, on a retreat I was on with an image of chocolate milk. <laughs> so uh, we're like the milk and God's the chocolate. Well, what happens when you dump a bunch of chocolate into the milk, but then don't stir it up? Well, you have chocolate on the bottom of the cup and milk filling the rest, right? 
The milk still looks like milk, tastes like milk, seems like milk, smells like milk, spoils like milk. Similarly, if we receive a sacrament, right, we get that glob of sacramental grace. But if we don't live our faith, right, if we're not living all three legs of that stool of asceticism and prayer um, with the sacraments, then we're not stirring it. But then as we live, as we live our faith, as we're, we're praying and denying ourselves and growing and seeking the Lord, we're stirring. Then as we stir, the milk looks like the chocolate, smells like the chocolate, tastes like the chocolate. Uh, the milk and the chocolate become one. Uh, the milk is chocolatized, right? So as we receive God's life, we start to look like God, smell like God, sound like God, act like God, right? We receive and live the theological virtues. We perfect our nature through the, the cardinal virtues, um, and, and it becomes a stable state, a habitual grace of divinization, of theosis, of being like God in the world. Right? This answers this question in a crude way. Uh, traditionally, uh, through the, the teaching, especially of St. Thomas Aquinas, but it's become the teaching of the church too, uh, the sacraments are sometimes broken up into stages. And I have a chart to help you follow along with this section. So there's three stages to a sacrament. The first is the sacramentum tantum. This is simply Latin for the sign alone or the sign in totality. So for each sacrament, the sign is the, the matter, right? The stuff that we use, the, the physical thing that God is coming in to us as. And then also the form. The form are the words of the sacrament, meaning what, what's the, the formula? What are, what's the prayer that goes along with it? Um, so when the matter and the form are, are present and the, a minister of the sacrament is present, who's intending to do what the church does, that's the sacramentum tantum, the sign alone. And all of this culminates in what's called the res et sacramentum, or the reality and the sign. So a lot of what we're going to be doing in this season of Physically Spiritual is actually going through this chart and filling it out. We have the, the sacraments of service, matrimony and holy orders, the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist, and the sacraments of healing or penance and anointing of the sick. So for each one, we're going to look at how Christ instituted the sacrament, right? Where is it in the scripture? We're going to talk about the form and matter, right? What the church intends. And then we're also going to talk one about the resit sacramentum. This is what God accomplishes regardless of, of what we mean, regardless of, of what the recipient is, is receiving. Uh, and then finally, the, the final stage is what's called the res tantum, or the reality alone. Right? This is the actual grace, the actual effect in the recipient's life. Uh, to, res, to explain the, the res et sacramentum and the res tantum a little bit more deeply, um, I want to talk a little bit about an ancient heresy called donatism. Uh, Donatism, in the time of the Roman, late Roman Empire, uh, one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church was teaching called St. Augustine of Hippo, a great doctor of the church. And, and the Donatists uh, believed that if a minister, like a, a priest or a bishop, were to fall away from the faith, if they were to recant the faith in light of persecution, which wasn't uncommon at the time, then that meant that all the sacraments they celebrated were invalid. Meaning if you were baptized by a bishop and they later uh, recanted their faith in the face of a persecution, you would have to be rebaptized because that sacrament wasn't valid because that man's faith wasn't true, right? They weren't truly holy. And Ignatius responding to this controversy made a distinction. The distinction was between ex opere operato, operato, sorry, from the work that's worked. Meaning, when the res tantum is, when the uh, sacramentum tantum is there, when, when the form and matter are present in the, the validly ordained minister or, or person who's able to minister the sacrament, does what the church intends to do, then the sacrament works. Right? It's valid. Meaning, if, if the minister, regardless, if they're a scoundrel or a saint, if they baptize you with water, use the Trinitarian formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they intend to baptize you, and you intend to be baptized, or your parents intend for you to be baptized, then that's valid, meaning it happens. The, the res et tantum happens. But on the other hand, there's another step deeper. 
That's the, what he called the ex opere operantis. So let's go back to the chart. This is from the work of the worker, this full far right column. Right? This is the actual grace or habitual grace that makes a difference in your life. Right? This isn't just the, for, so for an example of the mass, uh, so in, in the mass, the priest prays over bread and wine, and in that prayer, we believe that becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So that, that simple bread and wine, the matter stays the same, and the substance changes into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. That change, that body, blood, soul, and divinity, that what we call the real presence, is the reset sacramentum, or the ex opere operato, regardless if that priest is the greatest scoundrel in the world, right? just a scandal waiting to happen or a saint walking around us like the curie of ours, that happens. That work happens. But on the other hand, what we actually receive in the sacrament, the grace that's available to us, is affected by two things. This is the ex opere operantis, which is affected, one, by the holiness of the minister, by the person administering the sacrament, and two, it's by the minister of the, by the openness of the recipient. How capable are you of receiving the grace that's being offered to you? Uh, so this is going to be the primary focus of the season. Essentially, we're asking the question, how do we increase the ex opere operantis? How do we increase the res tantum? How do we experience actual grace in these sacraments? So when we keep going back to Mass or keep going back to confession, uh, that changes our life. We become a clear sign of, of God, we, we start to, to grow out of grave and habitual sin. We grow deeper and deeper in prayer. And, and by doing this, then, we become a, a greater and greater channel of God's grace in the world, more capable of receiving the grace that God's offering us and being a channel of that grace to others. Um, so this is the main focus of season through, to a physically spiritual um, on the section on the sacraments. So let's Take a glance at this chart one more time because uh, it's important that some of these sacraments we receive only once and others we can receive multiple times. So I have matrimony at the very top of the chart. Matrimony is kind of odd because we can receive matrimony only once, but you can only receive it once at a time. So uh, marriage is, as you may have all heard, from death till you part, <laughs> meaning once you're married validly, you can't get remarried until well, that person dies. And you can't kill them. That's in church law. <laughs> if you kill your spouse, you can't get married again in the church. Um, so that's not an out. But matrimony is unique. Marriage was there from the beginning. When John Paul II talks about marriage, he talked about it as the primordial sacrament. It's, it's sort of the form of God's relationship to his people even before the new covenant. So marriage is something natural. It's also something legal, right? It's from Adam Eve. It's also something legal, something that the, the government, it's a contract from the government's perspective, but it's also sacramental. It's something that, that Christ raised to the dignity of a sacrament. And a sacrament, like we said, is a, is a sign of grace. So in, in the sacrament, when the couple who are the minister of the sacrament to one another, right? And then the priest or deacon or bishop that's there is simply a witness on the church's behalf to that marriage. So the couple are the minister of the sacraments to each other. When they speak the vows with freedom and with consent, right? they work that sacrament. And the reset sacramentum is their communion. The two become one. They become one flesh. But in this, they become a sign of God's love to each other. And some would even say the primary sign of God's love to each other when they're in that relationship. Right? So, so the, 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 the husband and wife become a channel of grace to one another, and their mission becomes bringing one another to heaven, and then the children with them. And this is the ex opere operantis. Right? How do I become a channel of grace and love to my spouse? Uh, these next three sacraments, holy orders, baptism, and confirmation, we only receive once. And this is because each one has an effect that we call a sacramental seal, meaning these permanently change our soul, even to the point where when we, when we die are in our in heaven, that character remains 
on our soul. So since this, it gives us this character, we only receive them once. This idea of a seal actually comes from uh, the root word for sacrament in Latin was sacramentum. Right? So, so the prefix of that sacra comes from the word for, for holy. Um, but this sacramentum was something instituted in the Roman legion. They would get a mark or like a tattoo that would mark them as a member of the legion. Right? So even if they were to desert or something, they were, were marked permanently. And early Christians picked up on this idea uh, that we, in a sense, by being baptized and confirmed, were marked for God and that we couldn't, no matter what we do, wash that away, even if we recanted our faith. It was permanent, right? So these sacraments leave a permanent mark on our soul. Uh, so these, uh, these three sacraments that leave a seal on the soul, they, they sort of reconfigure us spiritually and, and set up a permanent channel of grace by which the Lord sanctifies us and brings about grace in the world around us. So while we only could receive baptism and confirmation once, right, we can more and more fully live our baptismal promises, meaning we continue to access grace by that stable relationship with God that they create. And on the other hand, when we sin, we fall away from those baptismal graces and graces of our confirmation, and they can be restored by our repentance and also the sacrament of penance. Holy order similarly leaves a seal on the soul, but it can be intensified in degrees. There's ordination to the diaconate, to the priesthood, and then to the episcopate to become a bishop. And then these final three sacraments, both the, the final sacrament of initiation, the Eucharist, and then the sacraments of healing, meaning penance and confession, are the sacraments we receive multiple times, meaning uh, we could receive them even daily if we wanted to and had a need to. Uh, so in each one of these cases, these, these are new opportunities for God's grace. And while they have a definite effect, right, the reset sacramentum, the ex opere operato, the, the work is accomplished by the form and matter and the minister conferring them validly, right, we're going to grow in our ability to receive them. We're going to grow in our ability to receive actual grace from them that changes our life. Um, so for the next uh, seven episodes— we're going to, on the sacraments, we're going to go through these seven sacraments. We're going to describe what they mean in detail, right? What the form and matter are, where they come from in the scripture, how they're instituted by Christ, how they're conferred validly, and what the, the definite effect of them is. But then we're going to look and take a deep dive into how do we receive them more effectively? How do I receive that grace that actually changes my life? that makes me an instrument of God's work in the world, that helps me grow in holiness. Um, and hopefully by, by doing this, we're building out that first leg of the stool. Uh, the episodes throughout the season are going to be um, sort of in a rotation. We'll talk about a sacrament, then we'll talk about the church's mystical prayer, and then we'll talk about uh, an ascetical practice. Uh, so in our next episode, we're going to start talking about the church's mystical tradition and after that, we're going to talk about asceticism. But I hope you stick with me as we take this deep dive into becoming the people God calls us to be. This show and all media on Awaken Catholic is made possible by Nation and the Hollow app. The Awaken Nation is a community of people like you who support all things Awaken for as cheap as a cup of coffee a week and get access to exclusive content. Learn more by visiting awakencatholic.org donate. Hollow is the only audio-guided Catholic prayer app focused on contemplative prayer and traditional Catholic meditation such as Lexio Divina, Daily Examine, and the Rosary. We here at Awaken all use Hollow every day and love it. To learn more or give it a try, visit hollow.app/awaken.